the outline of my talk. So when the question comes between particles and masses, my answer is yes. And the yes comes by saying, by introducing or discussing the so-called mass particle methods. I will discuss actually how you can do multi-resolution, not the uh, adaptiveness refinement way, by, but by using a uh, wavelet adaptive uh, grid for particles and meshes. I'll discuss a little bit about how we um, take these uh, complex uh, simulations, in particular the multi-resolution, and uh, use them uh, to do simulations in multi and many for architectures. And throughout the talk, you will see some applications, including one simulation we did back in 2007 that is in astrophysics, or the test case in astrophysics. So, um, the organizers also asked me that I should say something about exascale, and I would say something about exascale, and I would say that particle methods are a unique method to do exascale because they can go down from the level of the nanoscale, where you use molecular dynamics, this is one form of particle methods, with the well-known particle methods like SPH that people are using for astrophysics, and there are, of course, things in between that we do a lot in the lab that are related to swimming. But the common thing across all these cases is that you're using particles, and what do these particles do? Well, they move according to the velocity field, and how does the velocity field change? It changes according to the conservation law for something that we call the mass vortex methods and the mass SPH, and then you are getting um, simulations like that, where this is the grid, or you go away from conservation laws and proper, consistent, mathematically consistent approximations of conservation laws, and then you are modeling the right hand side, and that's where it comes um, molecular dynamics, or spelling molecular dynamics, and I'll actually put here SPH, and I would like to tell you that in my opinion, SPH is a model and not a consistent approximation of the governing equations. And I know that it's runs next, and I'm going to be on the menu with that, but that's, that's what it is. Um, so, uh, this is by following and adopting this acronym of mine of particles. This is what we have been doing in the And I can tell you that this is not because we know very well that the we do here are particles. I have had the chance of having some very students from computer science. in such a way that it would be very easy to just change the right-hand side, and by changing the right-hand side to do different physics from RNA translocation in carbon nanotubes in membranes to multiple fish to vortex rings. And as I showed you before, everything goes in the right-hand side, and all these other algorithmic things, they can be packed and, and, and become very, very efficient by, again, uh, getting some excellent students at the field. So, particle methods, let's look a little bit at the history because it's educational. So, going back to the 1920s, in fact, the first simulations in fluid dynamics were done with vortex particles. This is a vortex line. The simulations were done by hand, by Rosenhead, who was doing these computations. We had Feynman, who actually did particles, except that this time they are filaments, they are line particles, if you like. These are vortex filaments, and he was looking into the process of reconnection. And of course, some of the first simulations were these particle mess simulations by Harlow and Ross. Going to the area of vortex methods, and there people are looking into the velocity, vorticity, and you want to do vorticity because when you look at the weight of bodies, vorticity is confined. Therefore, you are doing an extremely efficient um, uh, discretization of your field if you are following vorticity. So, this work works in Russia, uh, in the US. And you have to appreciate the X's and O's for positive and negative. And these are the vortex filaments um, done to model boundary layers. Now, um, we come and in the fluid dynamics community, vortex methods are not so popular, and the question is why. Well, here is a simulation that was very popular in the 70s and 80s, and this is a double winner for it. Um, so this is for a Formula 1 car. The method is an unbeatable. First of all, you have complex geometries, you have no mesh, and you have only computational elements where vorticity is. So there's nothing better than this, and you have to ask why not everybody is doing that. Well, there were a few problems, and the problem was that back in the 70s and 80s, vortex methods were extinct, the same in the sense like the dinosaurs. 
And one of the things is that people could not expand it to fill dimensions so easily. There are no way to introduce boundaries. Fast food people methods have not been embedded, and there was no convergence. You will double the number of points, and you will get another result. So uh, by working uh, uh, with well, the interesting thing now is the same time that vortex methods were dying, SPH was emerging. It's the same time about, we have 1970s, that people started to do um, SPH and astrophysics. And again, what is the difference between vortex methods and SPH? The difference is that in one case you are doing compressible in SPH, uh, in vortex methods you do incompressible. They're both Lagrangian and adaptive, and one more advantage of SPH is you don't have a Poisson equation, therefore you don't need all these things to pass multiples. Okay? Um, but I claim that the same things that were lurking and killed vortex methods are behind these simulations as well. So what have we done in the meantime to fix this? Well, you we can do with SPH with all sorts of things. Now people do also incompressible um, SPH. So in the meantime, we fixed all this. And, and we actually, these are some simulations from our PhD. We're able to do boundary conditions. We're able to do convergence. We're able to show consistency. And we're able actually to challenge the problem. This is an impulsively started cylinder. It has a singularity. This is the drive coefficient. To beat a lot of other finite difference methods that you can see they have inaccurate drives because of dissipation. Um, and today, actually, there is one more thing that we can do. Again, as I said, thanks to my students. At the times that I was working, I was spending a lot of time in programming. I actually can solve this because of the efficiency of my past multiple code back then. So this one was taken about 20 days in the K, Y, and P, and squared and order in. We're breaking even at less than a thousand particles. And today, my students implement this on a GPU, and they can do it actually in 2008 in 150 uh, seconds. Now, um, so what else have we been doing today? So this is actually some other simulations. We're looking in the flow and growth of aircraft uh, wakes. Um, and this is very interesting because when your plane is taking off, you have to wait for the um, uh, plane in front so you don't tumble inside these big vortices. So back in 2008, uh, we were able to do some big simulations for 2008 and we were using 10 billion particles, and we were able to solve 60% efficiency uh, on a blue gene, an IBM blue gene machine. And, and again, the people in the lab spent a lot of great time doing visualization and beautiful volume rendering of the structures that you see on the waves of aircraft. So, um, again, uh, this is the method I'll be talking about. And I'd like to say something about this R, which uh, amounts to remission. So if you look at particle methods, uh, what do you have? You have a function, and then you take this function and you represent it as an integral. And if you take now this integral and you do a quadrature on it, you get point particles. These are delta functions. They don't have a size. So if you're looking for information between your particles, you do not have it. So a way to bypass this is you modify the delta function and you approximate it with a smooth function. And now you have smooth particle methods. Here I do it just for a function, but you can do it also for derivative operations. Now, it's important to observe that when you do these two steps, from here to here, you're introducing one length scale, and this is the modification. And when you go from here to here, you introduce one more length scale, which is the quadrature rule. And people, uh, for a long time, actually what people like about particle methods is that you can do very complex geometries by just putting down the particles. Now, the issue is that uh, when you have these two length scales, the error that you make from here to here, you have a, an error that depends on what kind of a function this is. So you have an error that is proportional to epsilon, and when you go from here to here, you have an error that goes like h on epsilon. So mathematicians tell you that if your h is not less than epsilon, a method is not consistently approximating a function, and even more, it's not consistently approximating differential operators. I'm aware that people in SPH know this issue, and they use all sorts of tricks to modify the epsilon to maintain some kind of regularity, and I would like to show you perhaps an alternative way. 
So to show you the alternative way, I will use an example. This is uh, coming from something that's called level sets. Level sets is something used a lot in describing surfaces. So this is a surface of interest, and instead of discretizing the surface, you embed it in a higher dimensional space. So you are uh, discretizing a, a two-dimensional, not only a line, and a two-dimensional domain. So what is a level set? Basically, you are looking into the level set zero, but at the same time, you are also discretizing all the other level sets. So instead of doing points or particles only on the line, you are doing particles or points on the domain. So the equations are the usual Lagrangian equations, except that this u depends on t. So this is where the nonlinearity is coming about. And um, what we can do with particles is you simply discretize your level set. You just move particles and do nothing else. So this is very uh, effective and very nice. And, and we can do things like that with deforming geometries. And here's a comparison between or something that's called solid body rotation. Here is, is a level set that has a dent. And if you take that and put it on a grid and you use a mesh space method, a purely mesh space method, this the grid is going to dissipate that. So you're going to disappear. But if you do it with just particles, well, you're going to get as good as it gets because particles are perfect for linear advection. So here you can say that particles are winning over grid based methods. So there is a catch. And the catch is when your particles they start to diverge, that's when H becomes larger than epsilon if you do not control it. And there is an exact solution of the Euler equations from the vorticity point that if you have a circular path of vorticity, this should stay circular. But if you do it with a vortex method without doing anything, or you can play as much as you want with epsilon, you can get something like that. And this perhaps explains why particle-based people like astrophysics. Not the other way around. So, the, it's interesting actually, there is a good way to see it uh, as a joke, but there's also something else that I'd like to say about that. So this was actually done um, by doing this uh, message. So this is bad, but it's not so bad. First of all, it doesn't blow up. So it's very remarkable that we still get all these structures, even though you totally violate everything about the consistency that you started with, so I think there is a lot of things that still need to be understood, but not from the point of view of approximating consistently a system of PDs, but from the physics that a set of particles that conserve mass and momentum um, are uh, represented. So um, what we propose is that you, every time you have particles and you can write this H over epsilon, you put on a grid, you do this interpolation, we're using all sorts of different interpolations. We're actually inspired by SPH and Monaghan and we're using moment conserving interpolations. So you go from the orange particles that are bad to blue particles, which are rather regular. And that's actually, again, how these simulations have been uh, done over there. So you can do it 1D, a moment conserving interpolations, 2D, 3D, you go into uh, tensorial uh, products. And if time allows, which probably will not, but I'll be happy to discuss, and I can show you that final difference actually are a subset of the mass particle methods. It's a big statement, but it's actually, uh, I can demonstrate that. So this is what we do. We move particles, and we maintain the large CFL of Lagrangian methods. We put things on particles to mess, so we have data scatter issues that we have to worry about. We solve Poisson equations and derivatives on the mess. So if I have, for example, SPH, I will do my derivatives on the right-hand side on the mesh, not in particles, looking for neighbors and so on. And then uh, the new thing compared to the old particle itself is that the mesh nodes become particles. This is remessed particle methods. No, no, they change. If I remesh density, I have to reproject it. I conserve the total mass, but my particles have no meaning. They are markers that they carry, they carry a property with them. They are not actual physical particles. And I do that. My grid points are uh, very Yes, I will do that. If I don't do a very, very fine mess, I will do that. But I'll come back to that. Yes. 
So here's some validations here. So there is a, a beautiful thing that you can do with invisit flows, and what is it is that there are experiments for invisit uh, flows. So actually, if you take electron plasma and you have it confined and inside a, a tube, then uh, they can let them e evolve. So if you take an elliptical distribution of these electrons, then you can get images of them. And if you let them go for a long time, you find that this is a steady state solution of the Euler equations. I already showed you one, which is this axisymmetric solution. Here is another one, which is a surprising solution of the Euler equations. So we did these simulations with these robust uh, particle methods. This is the effective dissipation that I have. And, and we got this thing to go around and around many, many times. So this was an experimental uh, uh, validation, if you like, for invisible flows. It only works for 2D, and unfortunately. And here is a comparison. If you take a cross-section and you look at the vorticity field between pseudo-spectral methods and vortex methods, and you have to observe that pseudo-spectral methods generate spurious negative vorticity, and they also do not maintain a maxima. Therefore, these are two issues that for invisible flows, pseudo-spectral methods are not so good. So here's what else we're doing today. We're looking into the singularity of the Navier scopes. We're trying to do simulations of colliding uh, vortex tubes. And you find some interesting phenomena here, thanks to the time that CSCS has generally afforded us. People in the world have been going up to here, and then they thought, you know, this thing is dead. But then we can run long-time simulations and find liquid physics, because these guys are not dead at all. But what happens is there is swirl that is imparted in these vortex tubes. So with vorticity, with swirl, it's actually a very violent uh, process. And people are looking to do this in high Reynolds numbers to see if there is a cascade of such events as a mechanism of, of turbulence. We have done a lot of validations between pseudospectral and vortex models for this problem. This is contrast of vorticity, which is a dark hard diagnostic. But you see, the nice thing about this method is that it compares also with finite element methods. This is the falling sphere. And it compares also with finite volume methods. This is for a shrinking piece. We're looking at the forward velocity. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, technique. So back in 2006, there was this test that the colleagues of the university were doing about this evaluate mass-based methods and, and, uh, and particle-based methods. So we did the same with something we call particle mesh hydrodynamics to distinguish for smooth particle hydrodynamics. Again, we do all the steps that I mentioned, moving and, and remessing and working on the grid for the derivatives, so we don't have to do these expensive derivatives that usually are done for SPH. And here is some the results. And I would like to tell you, actually, what is the problem now with remessing for compressible flows. And you can see it if you... Well, you see here is the density isosurfaces. And here is now a comparison between PMH, which is what we did, and SPH. And this was an adaptive mesh refinement calculation. And you can see that things are starting to become different. So SPH is very stable. AMR has picked up instabilities and makes this to break apart. And we are going in that way as well. So we are somewhere in between, as we might as well expect. Now, the problem with remesh methods for compressible flows is that remeshing um, screws up, so I'm sorry for the word, but it screws up discontinuities. And we don't know so far a good way to do shocks in remesh around shocks. So if in incompressible flows we have a smooth field, then remeshing and everything works really, really well. It has very interesting properties. There are people who are trying to do, like George Aricote in France, to try actually to do TBD type of, of remission schemes, and he actually has some kind of success. But I thought I'd bring this up here to show you that back in 2007, this is what we had with these methods. And I think perhaps people in the community would like to test this more. We're happy to give you a call that does image and, and check between these two different approaches. <coughs> now, um, about particle methods and remission. As you observe here, my particles are kind of regular, regular, and this is because of the remission. Now, the methods are adaptive because they are Lagrangian, but they have still a problem. And the problem is that they are inefficient. And why are they inefficient? Because in smooth parts of the domain, and in fine parts of the domain where the action happens, they have the same size of particles epsilon. 
So, of course, one thing that you can do, and that you can do adaptive mesh refinement with beta, when we relax, you have things on the grid, you can play all the tricks. But then, one thing that we looked at is that we said, okay, what does adaptive mesh refinement happen on? Usually, people use gradients, and one way one can see adaptive mesh refinement, you can see it as image processing. And when people do image processing, and they're looking into compressing their images, it's very rare that they would use gradients and, and curvatures to do a compression of images. But a very effective algorithm for image compression is wavelength. And that's actually what we thought that we can use to adapt grids by taking this idea and applying this to uh, the very mass stage. So this is what we do. We have a quantity of interest, vorticity, density, anything you want. We do a wavelet analysis, and then a place where we have active wavelet coefficients, we have active grid points. And you see the blue level, the green level, and the orange level. And then we discard wavelet coefficients uh, because of their strength and the threshold we pick, and we get an adaptive grid on this panel. So how do you do multi-resolution particle methods now with the machine? You know, mesh, you wavelet analyze, you come back, and you do wavelet reconstruction. It's not so trivial because you have to take care of ghosts and such issues, but I will skip this and show you some great success stories in the sense this is the convection problem I was telling you earlier. You take a circle, you convert it as a level set, and you play it back, and it has to go back to the circle. And whatever area you lose, that's your level. So you can see here, this is the state of the art with an Eulerian plus some subgrid scale particles that Fetio and others can use. And this is the order of convergence that we get. And we get a great bonus because for as little as your characteristics do not intersect, as it is often the case here, CFL less than one is not an issue for us. So this is for the 2D Euler equations also. And this is actually the MS SPH I wanted to. It's actually out of order here. So in overview of the machine, if you have incompressible flows and vorticity, this is the best of both worlds because you do vorticity, which is compact, and you do multi-resolution. So we think this is a good method for that. If you're having no socks or large discontinuities, we think the mass SPH is also a good method, but so far we have not introduced multi-resolution, and I'll tell you why. Because we were interested in shocks, actually, and discontinuities. So the path that we took is actually to go away from particles, because particles were not allowing us to do discontinuities. So we took the grid adaptivity we developed in this work, and we applied it now to finite volume methods, which is the second part of the talk. I have to read. So the idea is basically that you take all the PDs and you do them as filtering operations, and that's actually all the finite volume schemes that you can do. And I will skip this part, but I can tell you that we have implemented it in GPUs and CPUs by using something called wavelet adaptive grids. We can do overall time to solution by a factor of thousand compared to space adaptivity by doing algorithms and computers. Local time stepping giving us a factor of 24, vectorization giving us 1.8, another 8, and another 3 by the GPU. So it's almost even algorithms and, and computers to give us a time to solution of 1,000. This is comparison of Chombo, and this is two, three guys in a room beating Chombo, I think. And, and this is some of the simulations that we can do with finite volumes, and this is the rhythm layer. Mesh of instability. Um, this is another problem, which is the short power interaction. This is supercomputing 2012, 250 billion grid points, not particles, 35% of peak. And these were some of the simulations that we were getting last year. This is again the simulations with the adaptivity that I'm showing. And, and here is actually uh, another simulation that I would like to show because of the beauty, and this is actually, now our task was, okay, we want to do multi-resolution and we wanted to check performance. So we took a step back because we said, how do we know that multi-resolution and whatever implementation we have is good enough? So what we did is we went back and we studied uniform grids and we tried to do as much as possible computer tricks so that we can pump up the performance. So if you turn on the next piece for a second, 
but for, for you, you will not see the beautiful movie. So, uh, we, we do some public interaction, and, and we, the guys got in, in this gallery of blue dimensional world, so you can get really, really high um, uh, resolution simulations with this. The peaks, again, uniform grid. Um, this got 250 billion elements, 30% of peak. And we have improved on that. So this year, we're together with my colleague Thomas Sultis, one of the six finalists on the Gordon Bell uh, Prize, two out of Switzerland, uh, where we have done 11 petaflop simulations of cloud penetration collapse. We have been using 13 trillion elements. We were able to get a little time on Sequoia to do that, and, and we are doing now 15,000 bubbles. The state of the art was about 100 bubbles before. So I'll leave the summary up here. I'll be happy to take any questions. But before I do that, one more comment for Exascape. And it comes from a point from Antoine de saint -Experi. And I'll let you the call there. So it's about getting people to be inspired that this can give them um, something. So you teach them C, not about ships. And, and, and these are actually the people who did all the work. Abak is in the audience. Diego um, has been a, a magician. And Michael Berger was the guy who developed this idea of multi-resolution. I stop and thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.